Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's virtual event with Brookline Booksmith, featuring Molly Knox Oster Tag celebrating the release of The Girl from the Sea in conversation with Mariko Tamaki. My name is Alex Schaffner, and I'm the events director at Brookline Booksmith in Brookline, Massachusetts. If you're familiar with our store, welcome back. It's awesome to have you here. If this is the very first time that you're hearing about us, welcome. We are very happy to have everyone here join our community for the evening, and we appreciate very much your support of Molly Mariko and an independent bookstore through your book purchases and your attendance. On that note, I do want to remind everyone here that you can still buy books with signed book plates, both copies of Laura Dean and Girl from the Sea, through the Eventbrite page where you registered for this event until 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. So if you have any regrets, do not fear. There is still time to make your life a happier place. For tonight, as you can see, and as I said, the chat and question boxes are both open, so feel free to make use of those. Remember to set your chat to all panelists and attendees so that you can talk to other attendees, and please drop your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window so that they aren't lost in the chat. Please note that Brookline Booksmith has a strict policy against abusive behavior and language, and at our discretion, any attendee can be removed from an event for such behavior. Tonight, I am so, so, so excited to welcome Molly Knox, Astrid Tag, and Mariko Tamaki. When we were first told that we had the opportunity to host Molly for this book, I was overjoyed and my first thought was that we had to get Mariko in for this event. Mariko is a prose and comics writer whose comics especially have been world-changing for me as a reader. From Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me to her literally perfect YA Harley Quinn AU, Mariko's stories give room for queerness as not just one or two discrete facts about a character, but about culture, community, legacy, and companionship. While her characters are on the full gamut of good to bad ideas and kind to unkind choices, her books are driven by a deep love for the people that she writes about. She's an incredible writer, and we knew she'd be perfect for this conversation. So Aww. thank you, Mariko, for being with us today. Thank you. <laughs> Molly Knox Oscar Tag is the author and illustrator of the acclaimed graphic novels, The Witch Boy, The Hidden Witch, and The Midwinter Witch, and the illustrator of several projects for older readers, which we were actually just discussing, including the webcomic Strong Female Protagonist and Shattered Warrior by Sharon Chin. She grew up in the forests of upstate New York and graduated in 2014 from the School of Visual Arts, where she studied cartooning and illustration. She currently lives in LA with her partner and several pets. Now, Molly's work has been familiar to me for years, and in the last couple of years especially, Molly's presence in the comic scene has absolutely blossomed. For me, as someone who spent a long time working exclusively with children's books, it's been incredible to see the way the Witch Boy books have endeared themselves to readers, including teens and young adults who feel a sympathy in these books with their own younger selves, and even more importantly, with younger kids, kids who deserve love and kindness directed at them from the books that they read. They may be queer and they may not, but they're definitely reacting to a gentleness and creativity in these books that's unique and valuable. I'm excited today to celebrate The Girl from the Sea with Molly, Molly's somewhat more YA graphic novel about a small town girl who's feeling stuck on her island, a perfect little place to grow up that she cannot wait to get away from. But there's one thing especially that makes her almost want to stay, and that is gay teen mermaid romance, uh -huh. which sounds like a joke, but really, that's what the core of this is. It's a queer romance about finding yourself as a young person written from the heart. It is such a pleasure to have them both with us tonight. Please welcome Mariko and Molly. Thank you for that introduction. Oh my gosh. Such a sweet and thoughtful introduction. <laughs> I'm a little flustered. <laughs> I didn't have to wear blush. Now I'm just blushing. <laughs> um, I know, right? Um, I'm really excited to talk to you. I'm really excited to talk to you in general. And I'm really excited to talk to you about this book. It's so good to see you. Yeah, I'm so excited. I feel like we haven't had any cons, so I haven't had a chance to like corner you at a booth and like talk to you about this. So yeah. this is great. Um, so I think uh, like, I like uh, you. Alex just said that you started at SBA, and I think uh, for a lot of people, like a uh, one of the questions they want to know when they talk to authors is like how to get into sort of what you what you do, uh, or how to get into publishing. But I'm kind of curious, like of all of the sort of things that you did, including SBA um, and including working on a web comic, like what would you say? What would you say was like a key element in learning how to do what you do? Gosh, that's a really good question. I think that like, I mean, I think, I think that like you learn so much from different moments in your career and different projects that you take on. Um, the webcomic was, it really gave me like a work ethic and it sort of like, yeah. like helped me like learn how to kind of like, it, it really um, disabused me of a like perfectionist nature that I think a lot of artists struggle with where I was just like, 
I've committed to doing two pages of this superhero comic that is full of challenging things to draw. And I committed to doing that two pages a week and I'm going to do it. And so I think I learned just like a lot of kind of like grit from that. Um, and then I don't know, I, yeah, I, I, I like, I'm really, I'm really proud of Girl from the Sea because I feel like this is the first book that I sort of really took my time on and really uh, let myself breathe in the creative process. The Witch Boy series, I was trying really hard to draw them as quickly as possible because I just wanted the stories to be out and like right. I was on a pretty tight deadline like mostly of my own design not of my publishers but um yeah I think like from that I kind of like like absorbed I think when you just like when you do a lot of it you like absorb a lot of unconscious knowledge and then coming into Girl from the Sea I kind of had that like 10,000 10, 000 hours moment where I was yeah. like I actually have a lot of opinions and ideas and theory behind what I'm doing even though I didn't quite realize it at the time like or like I didn't realize that I was learning this until I'm suddenly putting it to use. Um, so yeah, I think it, it comes in all different places. I also like my wife, Noelle, like we talk constantly about stories and it's, right. it's an incredible <laughs> privilege to like have someone who is really on your level with that stuff and really also very interested. And we just like get into it in a way that I think is we're starting to reintegrate into society with people right. and I'm sometimes like babe we can't talk about like the movie that we are both obsessed with right now for like 30 minutes straight because not everyone cares um right but we, we really love like digging into stories and so I kind of feel like our relationship of the last six years has been like a master class of like both of us kind of growing as storytellers so, right well it's yeah. like the writer's life I think is so or the artist's life the creator's life it's such this like kind of mix of all of these things. Like I also have, uh, my partner is a writer, actress, storyteller, comedian. And so like we spend a lot of time watching movies and then like p taking them apart into little pieces and then like shining up those little pieces and talking about those little pieces incessantly. Yes. And I think that that is like, that is such the work of art is kind of like figuring out not just like, it's not just the ethic, which I think, you know, doesn't get talked about, I do know a lot of illustrators have a really intense work ethic. It's almost like an athletic work ethic around like yeah. getting stuff done because it is yeah. like, I wonder if that's because it's like the manifest of a page kind of lends itself to that. Like, I'm going to finish this page. I'm going to finish mm -hmm. this art versus like writing a chapter, which feels like this kind of like amorphous blob most of the time. Yeah, yeah, definitely the the concrete steps to finishing a piece of art is very interesting because I sort of recently transitioned, I like work in animation sometimes and I transitioned from doing design work to doing writing work and animation. And it's just so different, like the process with which you approach art is like brainstorm and sketch, but eventually I find something and then I kind of know the steps to take it to final. Right. And writing maybe it's just me or maybe I haven't written as much but like there's never a clear set of steps that will take you to the final it's just no. like I mean, <laughs> yeah it's like if I can spend 12 hours on a drawing I know that I'll have something at the end yeah. and like when you spend 12 hours trying to write something I mean it's not that it's useless but it's not you can't say okay I'm gonna have 20 pages usually it's like I figured something out <laughs> yeah I realized that I had to delete all of my previous work but don't worry I've got an idea but like it's it's not concrete and so yeah, yeah that has been a really interesting thing to learn like coming from art kind of and shifting more into writing yeah I mean so I think that is it do you feel now that you're like taking more time on the writing process as opposed to like, do you feel like that's taking up more of your time or is it sort of like between something like Witch Boy and something like Girl from the Sea, do you feel like you've kind of moved towards spending more time writing or like, or is that something you're getting more interested in or? Yeah, it's definitely something I think about more. And like, I'm sort of, I'm curious about like how you're kind of like are getting into stories and like putting out your first couple narratives works because I feel like I sort of have this theory that I think like everyone has one or two stories that they've always been wanting to tell since they're kids. Right. Um, and when you sort of accumulate the skills to be able to tell them, you sit down and it just like flows out and it feels very natural and creative. Um, and then I think as you get older, it sometimes gets a little bit harder. Um, maybe that's yeah. just a phase of my life I'm in right now, but it, it gets a little harder to have that like unconscious flow of like, this is exactly what I want to see in a story. And you have to think about it more and kind of really figure things out. Um, so like, that was my experience. I felt like Witch Boy was a very kind of like, like natural sort of like, it wasn't easy, but it was like, I, I had a lot of instinctive feelings about what I wanted the story to be. 
Um, and uh, you were just showing me that you have my um, How the Best Hunter in the Village Met Her Death comic, which is a mini comic, which is my favorite thing I've ever done. Um, but it's like, that was another one that was very unconscious because it was just like the story that I need to tell. Um, and I feel like as I kind of like, like have put those stories out into the world, realizing that I still want to tell stories and I still have these like nuggets of like, here's my instinct yeah. for what's interesting, but to really flesh it out, I need to be a little bit more um you know like read the story structure save the cat books and everything which are so <laughs> cheesy but also helpful because it just makes you think about like what goes into making a story satisfying yeah yeah I really like um lessons from the screenplay which is a, a series that is about movies but ostensibly about storytelling that I think he does a really great job of kind of like breaking down like want need like sort of key themes in books and then kind of like like making them into things that I find easy to apply to storytelling. I do yeah. think that there is generally a story for creative people. There's like the story you've been telling you since you were a teenager, like that you've kind of been like shaping in various forms. It's kind of like your heart story yeah. that you like finally put out there. And then once you put that out there, you're like, what else do you want to say? <laughs> like, what else do you want to talk about? Yeah. And then I think it gets into, like, I think it's like, if you can pull that little like heart nugget of like, what is at the soul of your characters like the the soul frustrations the soul like wants and needs of of your characters and pull them into different places and put various for amounts of distance between you and your characters so that it doesn't have to be directly you it can be like mm -hmm. you ish but actually one of the things that i wanted to talk about with you is i think the thing that i love about your work is that your work is incredibly personal and i think that there's always this you know, amazing feeling connected to them. It always feels like, uh, like I feel like there's just something that feels very real about the way your characters interact and, and the way they express themselves. And at the same time, all your, almost all your stories are magic, right? Like almost all your stories have this element of magic in them. And so it is, I think, you know, and I think that you see this more in sort of, in, in sort of YA middle grade now, this kind of combination of, like really realistic teen life and also magic, like something that's magical. And I was wondering, what do you think is the benefit of bringing, is it like that you are like, I just can't see a world without magic and I want magic in the world? Or is it that there's something that you think magic brings to these stories? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I definitely, and I think, yeah, so much of the stuff I figured out like as I've made work, because I, I, if you asked me that like five years ago, I would have just been like, oh, I just love fantasy and I want to draw right. lines, um, which is true. Um, I, I so I like have been doing this like intense deep dive into uh, Tolkien and Lord of the Rings in the last year, and just like I know, <laughs> like, I know everybody. It's very, it's very embarrassing. Oh, <laughs> but he has this amazing quote that I'm going to mess up. But it's basically he's like, I wrote a fantasy, and I wrote kind of like it's. I think it's called on fairy stories. Um, because he, he's like, the fantasy is like a form of truth and the fantasy is a way to, uh, it's like a, uh, he describes it as like a like restorative way almost to kind of like connect back with the world. Um, in that, I think like the classic example is like that dude loved trees and he wrote the ants to kind of like embody trees and be like the most tree that anything could possibly be. So right. that when you're walking around in your ordinary life, you feel this extra connection with what is already there. And so I, I, I really love that about fantasy. And I think that that's like, without necessarily knowing that's what I was doing, that's very much like not to have these like direct metaphors exactly, but to have the fantasy, have it represent how, like have the heightened element of the fantasy represent how those feelings actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That it's like, it's like if your yeah. soul is this thing, yeah. like that flying is about feeling like you're flying or like, yeah. you know, like feeling magical, feeling powerful. As like an incredible metaphor. Yeah, and like yeah, like in in Girl from the Sea, it's it's yeah. This girl comes out of the ocean. She says that she's a selkie. Um, she's like used to be a seal. She takes off her seal skin. She's a cute girl. She represents everything that our closeted main character kind of isn't ready to face. Um, and there's something about that about the like. I feel like that is it. Just feel, things feel so intense when you're a teen, and your first love, like it can feel that intense. It can feel like you are magic like where did you come from how is this happening um and so I think like trying to capture those feelings fantasy can be a really good way to be more emotionally accurate than if if it was just um uh, sort of a, a non-fantastical story yeah I mean actually so one of the things that I was thinking about is like that there's also this kind of 
the fant the fantastical kind of fairy tale stories of today to me are like a chance to sort of like make explicitly queer or sort of queer or like also kind of like save like because like even just thinking about mermaids if you actually like the actual story the original story the little mermaid is a horrible story yeah. that yeah. ends with this woman it's foam like it's like about a woman who sacrifices something and her sacrifice for love means self-obliteration yeah. yeah as opposed to like self-realization which is so much about what your stories are about like using magic like finding yourself like really i think girl from the sea is really such a great coming out story because it's a coming out story that really focuses on not so much the sort of like can I admit to the world that I'm gay but like can I admit to the world who I am can I be who I am as opposed to pretending and putting myself in this box and pretending I'm multiple people you know yeah. which I think is so it's a great version of that story yeah oh thank you I was it's funny like I was so I feel like there's so many coming out stories and I was I was really conscious of that when I was writing this book but just really feeling like it was something I had a lot of feelings about and yeah I think approaching it from that very internal place um and that kind of realization of just like what are the core fears at coming out even if you're not particularly afraid of like a homophobic friends or family and to just have like like the the incredible vulnerability of being like here I am I am declaring myself I am different from other people um that's like I remember feeling that about a lot of different things in around like this age in my life. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, and you really like, it is her vulnerability. Like I think uh, not that, I mean, I, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully this isn't spoilers, but there's like a really great joke that the mom tells that's like the best mom coming out joke uh -huh. ever. Like this awkward mom coming out joke uh -huh. where you're just like, yeah, it's really her. And I think that really it's not the story about the sort of like, will society accept me? It's like, can I get over the things that I'm afraid of, which are about me and not so much yeah. about anything that anybody else is gonna say about me? Yeah, yeah, and I think we we have this feeling that sometimes that things that we feel aren't real because if they're, if they're only inside us, then they don't exist on the outside and that means they're not real. Um, and I think like Kelty, her love interest in the book is really this representation of like, like it's like it's a romance, but it's also Kelty is, goes parts of herself on the outside in a person that she loves and is attracted to and wants to make happy and kind of treating those secret parts of yourself almost like you would treat them if they were someone else. Um, yeah. Realizing that then you have to honor them and that keeping a person in a box is uh, like, like just as like cruel as like keeping yourself in a box. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's really such a great book of contrast. Like, like the person who is, which I think, you know, um, it's like a, like one of the things that I was thinking of, I was reading, um, I'm gonna see if I can find the quote. Uh, like you said in an interview once that you discovered your queerness by falling in love. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that this is really so much a book about the dynamics between two people as being the thing that, that creates the space where she can sort of be herself. That yeah. it's not something that she kind of has to go off and do on her own that it's like her relationship with her friends and her relationship with Kelty is like that she's working through that. Even like, you know, connecting with her brother, that her brother needs her to help him deal with the, his, you know, their parents' divorce. Like that so much of those things is in, is in, in relationship as opposed to being like on your own, which I thought was yeah. a really great story. Yeah. And it always is like, that's how our lives are. We're so rarely the, the, orphan who's like set off on an adventure and is alone in the world that's almost no one's experience yeah um, there's so many stories about it because those relationships with people are so complicated um right. yeah but like growth is personal growth is only one side of it and then there's the side of like like having other people sort of grow and how they see you and and yeah yeah, yeah. It's, very, it's very complicated <laughs> yeah no I think that that's I think it's a really like I have often said um I have often said and I think I'm like I'm adjusting my messaging as I go that I was kind of done with coming out stories mm -hmm. um I think just because like I came out when I was like 17 and it's been like more than 20 years so I'm kind of like like I'm feel far past that that part of my story but I think every time I read sort of modern versions of that and I think because you know, coming out is really a sort of part of this kind of ongoing evolution of people's understanding of themselves. And I think that that's what this book is too, right? Like that it's like, 
that we're that we transform that we that we grow and we change and we change in relation to the people around us and we change in relation to understanding of ourselves which i think is like a really great as opposed to just like i had this horrible secret about myself someone else finds out this horrible secret my life is never the same like you know that's yeah. one version of it which is valid but also I think that this it, is, this is to me really interesting. Yeah. And that's the story that we have told so many times already. I'm also, I'm really interested in sort of the morality of like why certain stories you were talking a minute ago about the, like the little mermaid and how it's this book of, or this story about, yeah, a woman kind of like being like destroyed and like being immolated for love. And it's just so, it's so interesting to look at like mythology and fantasy stories and folklore and there's always a morality to it there's always some kind of lesson or something that is reinforcing some kind of cultural uh, uh meme i guess and it's really cool to approach them from a modern perspective and try to kind of change them and queer them and yeah. to be like i'm not just going to take the selkie story and make it two girls i also want to take the selkie story and examine you know what roots of it like made it sort of a, a very patriarchal very heterosexual story and then how to kind of what queering it does and that that changes the essence of the story itself. Yeah, I mean, really the idea of like queering a thing, like the idea of creating a character who's the queer character, that's not queering anything, that's just adding a queer character versus yeah, like, exactly. yeah. you know, it's like, a, and so many, you know, so many queer and trans activists have been talking about this more and more. It's not just about the idea of like, accepting one other person into your world as being acceptable as accept or like dismantling all of the assumptions we have yes. about what is good and what is bad and what is acceptable and what is not underneath all those things. Yeah. Um, that's like a, <laughs> very like a whole other theory. Topic. What yeah, seriously. Um, but it's so but, exciting. I mean, that's what's, that's, yeah, that's why we want to engage with these stories. Like, like, it's yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's why too, it's like, I think, um, like one of the things in terms of like for me like going back and seeing some of the queer things that influenced me like my queer roots in terms of like things like Desert Hearts and stuff like that like the sort of the stories that were the sort of origins of my sort of queer storytelling um, has been really interesting and I was wondering what are your like in terms of explicitly queer or not necessarily explicitly queer roots in terms of the stories that you remember and the stories that you that were like, affected you the most. Yeah. Wow. That, okay. That's, yeah, that's like a really interesting question. Cause I feel like there's so many, there's both the things that were like, I feel like at a certain point, if I read anything that had lesbians in it or any sort of like too explicit mention of it, my brain was just like static. And so I was like, I know that there's like a fantasy series that's like all lesbians. I don't know if you know it. It's like a pretty classic fantasy series from like the eighties. And I read like all the fantasy section in my library. And I just remember that when I was just like, like, brain not processing half of this book um but yeah I think um thinking of like I think I was like like there's some stuff that I that was coming out and that I was watching like right when I was like it was really really hitting me that I was I was queer and like I couldn't ignore it um I think one of those things was Mad Max Fury Road I just felt like it was this and I think almost paired with that I would pair Thelma and Louise which yeah. I also played for the first time and it was um just like these ideas of like women running away from society and sort of like finding their own like way to live and sort of like finding themselves and like just completely like like giving up on this one part of the world I, it was really yeah those those were very they're very they go very very deep for me um Thelma and Louise that's amazing that's it's such, I mean, it is, no one ever, it's like a gay movie. They kiss at the end. Like, I sometimes feel like I'm going crazy because no one says it's gay, but it's like, they kiss at the end and then they drive into the, into the Grand Canyon. It's so sad. Spoilers. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a gay choice, even if they weren't gay. Okay. To kiss somebody and then drive into the Grand Canyon with them. That's pretty gay. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, and I think like, um, yeah, like the, the reason I've been like, like doing so much Tolkien exploration this year was like realizing that I really think there is like a queer romance at the heart of Lord of the Rings and just being like, I think that that spoke to me in a way that I, again, these things are sort of, sometimes when they're hidden and you're a kid, it's a little easier to engage with it. And so I think, yeah. so yeah, like that, that was like the level of, of, of sort of like supplemental queerness that I could access as a kid. And now as an adult, it's really interesting to like, like really dig into it. Um, I mean, now it's interesting because like when I grew up, there were no, like, you know, it was like me watching Linda Carter as Wonder Woman being like, yeah. you know, like deeply in love, but like, you know, 
it wasn't even like Xena warrior princess. Like it wasn't even that, like she yeah. had like a female sidekick that was like, she was sitting by the fire with, like that wasn't even happening. But now it's, I mean, it's interesting to think of like, that there is, that there's things that are explicit, right? Like now that there is like, even for like younger readers to be able to pick up, you know, the girl from the sea and read a story and have that be like, like a starting point for their like exploration of queer literature. And even like, you know, I think even like to think of like your work as being like, yeah, like some little like queer kid and like that queer kid too, or like, like this is like their start of like thinking about stories yeah and then they can go and write you know their gay hobbit stories and you know and so on my thing, like i just can't i can't wait i think with the like generation of kids kind of like coming into their own right now grew up in a really different world but like even i did and i just can't wait to see what they do i'm constantly like like i don't know just wanting to see where they're going to take things because i think that their their bar of like what they want to see in media is so much higher like i'm so i think we, you get so used to being fed on crumbs um, yeah. and like, I think, I think that like, definitely like, like kind of like our generation of people was like, okay, actually like, let's try to like get some meat on the table and not just crumbs, but I can't, I just can't wait to see what the, yeah. the young queer creators coming up will do. Yeah. I mean, even just like, you know, like when I was like, even when I was like in my twenties, like there was starting to be queer literature, but it wasn't considered mainstream literature. Right. Yeah. Like it was like, like in the woman's bookstore, you know, like there would be like a couple things, but it wasn't something that you could find just sort of readily. And now yeah. even yeah. just like, oh no, sorry. no, go ahead. Oh, I just remembered we had um, a like very like left wing uh, uh, newspaper in our house that ran like to watch out for by Alison Bechdel. So that is definitely like the first, definitely the first time I like saw the word dyke, the first time I read like a lesbian cartoon, like, um, but it, it's funny because you sort of don't, I, I just didn't process it. Like, I don't know, or you sort of know, but you just don't quite connect it with yourself or with what you potentially could be or with anyone that you potentially could know. And that's right. always really interesting. Well, it's like, there's so much more language, even for like, you know, even for there to be like a resting point for younger people to be able to say like, they don't know what they are. Yeah. Like even for that to be like an option as opposed to like, you are guaranteed straight from the moment you show up, you know, yeah. and then you have to like switch gear somehow. Um, so I had like a very gay question. <laughs> was, um, no, your gay questions. <laughs> no, <laughs> weirdly. Um, so I was thinking about like, you know, sort of like if there was to be like queer badges, uh, <laughs> like if you could like give yourself, if you could give yourself that you already have three queer badges and then you could think of three that you're working on now, like my queer badges would be like, plant propagation, uh, you know, soup, soup stock making and uh, like needlepoint. And I would be working on my like queer history badge and my, um, you know, fashionable Birkenstock badge and various other things. So I didn't know if you would have, like that's a very specific I love that. Like. <laughs> I love the Birkenstocks and they're, they're such a look. Um, so I recommend them. Yeah, I feel like, okay. I feel like I have like a gay fashion badge. Um, I think I have a cat lady badge. Oh yeah. Um, and gosh, and there's just so many to choose from. I think I have a fan fiction badge. Gay oh. fan fiction badge. I feel like I'm working on like queer theory. I've been trying to read a lot more stuff besides just Twitter and like go back a little bit. Um, so that's that's actually been really cool to kind of be reading some older stuff um, and just like like connecting more with our history. Um, and then I think there's also like, like an activism, like component that I've been like trying to do, especially as we're coming out of the pandemic, finding places to volunteer with. And that's just, I mean, that's not explicitly queer, but it's like, it's a very, oh, for sure. it's a, I don't know, this feeling of like reconnecting with your, um, community, it feels very important to me. And the more, the older I get, and the more I think about queer community, the more I think about like connecting with the people around us, especially in, in our physical space that we share, like in our city, in our town is like yeah. a very, very important thing. Um, yeah, gosh. Yeah, I mean, it's like, we all have these kind of like, like to me, my queer space is like when I have my queer friends over and we like, you know, watch movies yeah. about musical theater and stuff like that. But it's also about wanting to create, be part of larger queer spaces. Like when I lived in Toronto, I was a part of this community around Buddies and Bad Times Theater. And it was like, so amazing to have a place that was like making art and part yeah. of the community, but those spaces are, they're also like hard to maintain. And I think especially yeah. when you're a writer, 
And so much of your job is like, look, I'm just in my room and I just have to do this thing and listen to my podcast till this gets done. It's hard to kind of go from that to like the community. Yeah. But the community yeah. is also so feeding, right? Like it feeds your inspirations. And I think, uh, like, I, I mean, do you see yourself as like a part of like a, like a sort of queer arts community? Like you have like books and stuff that influence you, but also like queer people in your life that influence you, I would imagine. Definitely. I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think I like was so lucky to come up in this wave of um, like women and queer people who were sort of getting like a seat at the table in comics. And like, not that that wasn't happening already, because like, obviously, like Alison Bechtel, like it was happening. But um, I, I think it, it, we sort of, it was almost like, like trendy <laughs> for a minute, um, which is like its own issue, but definitely helped when I was like young and sort of just trying to like, like, yeah, make stuff. Um, so yeah, I think I like definitely feel community with a lot of people in comics. And then it's been really cool living in Los Angeles and really sort of like solidly planting myself in the animation industry and just trying to, just trying to reach out to people. And I think it's like realizing that you can just invite people to do things and you can just be like, we're having a gay picnic and it's like it's so often it's like it's not even like it's not like I'm checking IDs at the door like you can bring if you're like with a straight boyfriend you can bring your boyfriend it's fine but it's just like it's it's we're having it's a space that is like sort of prioritizing a certain voice and a certain kind of person yeah um, and that can be really cool to just realize that you can literally make it yourself yeah um, yeah when I was first coming out of Montreal uh in like the 90s there was a bar and they the sort of story about this bar was that they would check and see if you were gay before you came in and I was always like my friends because this was before I was out the first time I went was before I was out and my friends were like uh they're probably gonna make you make out with a girl if you want to go in and I was like you're like that would be okay. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's like well I guess if we have to do that mm -hmm. we will have no choice we'll just have to go um okay so I feel like I should uh like I want to make sure that we talk enough about about this book before we go into Q&A uh, and so one of the things that I know and as a Canadian I'm obviously especially excited to hear this is that this is inspired by Nova Scotia yeah by the beauty that is Nova Scotia so I think it's like was it I mean I'm sort of picturing you because you live in LA and like mentally did you go back and do some like kind of scouting around or was it just like a lot of looking at family pictures or yeah actually let me pull up our like so, so my family, um, my parents are both teachers, and so we would, like, lived in um, upstate New York, and then every summer during their, like, summer breaks and our summer breaks, we would drive up to Nova Scotia and spend um, two to four months, I would say, on this tiny, tiny little island in, like, like far, far off in Nova Scotia. Um, so I'm just going to, like, screen share to share a picture of the island because it's so pretty. Um, oh, my gosh. Yeah. yeah. It's incredible. It's, this is our house. And it's just like a couple neighbors. There's like a little bridge that connects it to the mainland. There was um, no Wi-Fi, <laughs> no no phones, no no cable. Um, so it was very kind of, or there was like maybe a landline, but there was no like cell phone service. So it was just very very isolated and so so beautiful. Um, and yeah, I they they still go up there every summer except for last one because of COVID. And so I went back a couple times in the course of working on the book to take photos and then I got them to take some photos and yeah, I'm, it's such a specific place. It, it, I just spent like so much of my life there and so much, um, like not pay, only paying attention to the place that I was in, like not distracted by school or friend drama or like TV right. or anything. And so I just have these, I just like, I don't know. It's just like, like, I can just tell you like every inch of the islands and what it looks yeah. like and what it feels like and what this like sunrises look like and everything. And so it was really cool to get to put that in the book because it felt like an homage to this place that was really important to me. Um, and then it was also really lovely. Um, Marta Laiho colored look and she, I forget if she, I think she said she was from like the coast of Maine or had spent time there. And she really brought like I'm sorry, you have a, you have an ARC, so it doesn't have colors. <laughs> oh, no, the first couple pages do. Okay, yeah, but she, she definitely had sort of an understanding of what I was going for, where it's this dreamy summer romance, but it's not like a white sand beaches kind of, kind of summer. It's this like kind of yeah. cool coastal thing, and it's, it's got its own really specific beauty, and its own kind of contrast of like, 
beautiful and wild and it kind of feels like anything could happen but it's also very lonely um so she she did a really good job with the coloring of just capturing the atmosphere of it yeah I mean I was thinking like it's such a great place for this kind of story because it's beautiful but also if you're a teenager it's a little boring and it's a little isolating but it's also like you know it's like one of those places like as an adult you're like this is the most magical place in the world and as a kid you can be like yes and no (laughs) like sure because it's sort of at a certain point I was a teen and I was like I can't come up here anymore I'm gonna like go to summer camp and now I can drive I just like I can't spend this time on this island with my parents and my little sister and like there's nothing to do um and so I stopped going and then going back with Noelle was this really lovely experience because Noelle was like this is so beautiful (laughs) and we could go to like the little fisherman's bars I couldn't go to as a teen and it was just right so cool to get to see it through someone else's eyes and to really realize how special it was. Yeah, I mean, it's like this, uh, because when uh, Jillian and I did this one summer, we went back to the cottage. uh, That was sort of like the place that inspired it. And it was crazy because she had never seen it before. And I was sort of like, that rock, oh my God, the tree. Like, I was so excited. She she, was it just from your childhood? It was from my childhood, but she'd never been there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it was like a place that I used to go to the cottage all the time. And uh, we went back and I always love, uh, I said, like, I've, I've been to a lot of places with illustrators where she was like taking pictures of the garbage cans and stuff like that. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. I was like, okay, <laughs> Look, where you're like the illustrator's eyes like wandering yeah. around and my writer's eye was like in like reverie and like all these other places. And she was very specifically capturing like little bits of the world. Yeah. Another thing that I think is so great in this, um, and I think it's so hard to do, and I struggle with it for sure, is the sort of like, I think that there is a part like, you know, magic and story and the kind of like world that magic and story happens in. But then in the modern world, there's like texting and stuff like that. And so how to incorporate those two things, like the choice to like, like one of the things you don't do is, I don't think there's any social media in this. There's no like, not really, yeah. Posting things, but there's yeah. texting, right? There's that kind of like, uh, which I think lends itself really well to comics, a kind of like word balloon type thing of like mm-hmm. all these four people having a conversation. So was it like a choice to just like sort of, like did you sort of pick and choose? Like what am I gonna bring from teenage modern life into this story that makes it, because it's, I think one of the things it does is as soon as you see that and you see it right from the beginning, you're like, this is today. Mm-hmm. As opposed to like, this could have happened in the eighties or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like there's so much, so much teen stuff right now, especially movies and TV shows are set in the eighties. And I'm always like, man, I get, I get that this is like iconic, but I really want to see the updated version. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't put social media in. I think I was a little afraid that I didn't know how teens use social media and I, I just didn't want to mess it up too much. Um, but it also, yeah, what was in, like the purpose it serves in the story is to really be um almost like the like Greek chorus of the book where it's like her group chat she's in that she's slowly neglecting um and to get this feeling of her friend group um even though even though she doesn't have a ton of scenes with them um so yeah like I actually I, I rewrote a lot of this book because I wrote it I had an idea I sat down to start drawing it my idea was mostly just the romance and I sort of got like 50 pages into pencils and I was like, wow, I'm drawing all this like lovely sapphic romance and it's so beautiful. And then I was just like, man, there's like, this is so boring. There's no conflict. Um, and like Morgan's friends were kind of these flat, like basic teen girl characters, which like, I hate when I see that. And I was like, why am I writing this? Um, so then I kind of uh, like, like threw out those pages and sort oh, of, wow. <laughs> I know, I don't usually do that. Um, but yeah, I sort of rewrote it and and really, I both like introduced the conflict of Kelty's motivations and sort yeah. of like that kind of like second half of the book. And then I also was like, I don't necessarily want to draw a ton of scenes with these girls, but I, this is such a, a way to be like, they are always there. Like they're always with her. Mm-hmm. And it's, I think that that's like, sort of ties into the theme of like, like being afraid to come out and being afraid to be seen because it's almost like when you have your friends with you all the time, you feel like you're never unobserved. And so you're always kind of worried yeah. about that. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was kind of fun. I really based, I just based it on like my own sort of group chats, um, but it was, it was really a fun way to kind of get to bring in their personalities. Yeah. Well, and I think too, one of the things it does is it kind of illustrates the kind of like the issue of communication, right? Like in terms of, that you can have a lot of people talking, but in terms of who's communicating, who's being seen and who's being heard and how you can kind of 
you know, like how Morgan kind of opts out of a conversation, how you can kind of, especially when you have four friends on a chat and then yeah. they kind of notice you're not there and that you haven't said anything, like how you can kind of like make yourself disappear from a conversation. Yeah. Even in a world where everybody's talking all the time, which I thought yeah. was really interesting. Yeah. And you can sort of, yeah, you can, you can nominally be present, but actually have your heart and your mind be somewhere else. Um, yes. Yeah. I think, and then having Kelty be like Morgan just has to like, doesn't I don't know like like it's a purely kind of like in person relationship and and that like also sets it apart from these friends yeah well somebody who's really present right like somebody who is just like you kiss me I like you I'm here now this is what's happening and to yeah, have someone who's yeah. like oh I don't know uh, I don't really know what's going on I love the dynamic between that oh, it's so great thank you and it's like it's fun I'm really yeah I, I, it, it, I really liked I ended up really really liking the girls especially Serena I was like man this girl yeah has her own book. she's so she's so weird <laughs> yeah I mean I uh it's interesting actually because I didn't I do think it is it is a thing in writing I think you know so many people especially when you start writing like the actual editing part of writing is is such a hard thing to sort of get a grasp of because I think it sort of feels like if I have to do this over it's all going to disappear like writing is so like it's concrete but it's so ephemeral at the same time so it's a pretty bold choice to like scrap like which I've done for the last book I wrote I rewrote four times before I yeah. finally finished it because I was like I have no idea what this is like you can be halfway into a story and be like okay well I don't actually know Mm -hmm. why this is interesting anymore mm -hmm. but that's yeah. also a part of writing which is like I don't know if anyone's I don't know if this actually works like you're like when you're so in the middle of it it's so well, complicated like you don't know what it needs until you've started to, until you've gotten halfway through and then you realize it's wrong and that's like it can feel so frustrating and it can feel like you've wasted so much time but it's like you wouldn't have learned that unless you had had written it out and so I think yeah it's, yeah. it's like it's definitely, I'm usually really disciplined with myself of like be super solid on the story before I start drawing. But I think I was, I was very excited to work on this book and I was also kind of working on it while also writing on a show and my mind is a little split. And so I was like, if I can just like write on the show and then come home and draw a little bit of like sweet romance at night, I'll, I'll get it done. And then at a certain point I kind of looked at what I had and I was like, this isn't, I, <laughs> I both like learned from like having written on a show and then sort of like developing as a writer in that way. And then I also, yeah. 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 I mean, I think it's, um, it's a, it's a weird, yeah, it's like a, it's the weirdest job, honestly. Like it's like, it's almost like too, I think it's like the better you get at it, the more you have to be sort of like, on the one hand, it makes some things so much easier. Like I feel like I've been writing comics for long enough that actually like outlining is very easy for me. Like I can yeah. picture like what 20 pages looks like. It just sort of like comes to me. But then it's like the things that make, that go really fast. It's like, there's other things that will never go faster. Like the actual figuring out of character. Yeah. Like, and actually filling those 20 pages with an interesting character. Can you always feel be hard. Like, um, I feel like I experienced this like like I just started to experience this with like this book and a couple other projects I'm currently working on where I was like okay I can't do this theme because I already explored it in this book I can't do this kind of character because I already explored her in a different book like do you feel like do you get worried of like overlap in your creative creative works I used to but then I just sort of thought I don't know I've been reading this one author um who's this woman Karen Slaughter who writes these murder mysteries and I'm on her like 10th book now and I'm like She's obviously not worried about that. I love that. <laughs> She's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's and like, you know. I, I love to read that in other, I love to be like, oh, this person loves a tragic romance or something. And like, you write right. it all the time. And I, I love seeing all the different ways you write it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, so Q&A. Okay. So okay. Should, we, should, we, should I read the Q&As? Should we do oh, that? Okay. Alex is going to read them. Oh, oh yes. Alex is going to read them. Um, Thank so you. Sorry, I got really it. Actually. <laughs> All right, I'm back. We have some really good questions. So thank you guys who have been in the audience. Um, this has been an awesome conversation. Um, I actually have a first question, Molly, which is, do you have any favorite selfie stories that you can recommend to everybody? Because I feel like that is an underserved category of awesome fantasy creature. Yeah, it's totally underserved. Um, these are only ones that I watched after I had had done the book, but The Secret of Ronan Nish is incredibly gorgeous, incredibly classic. And then um, Song of the Sea is a beautiful animated film. And then, yeah, there's there's not a ton of sulky stuff. I think I mostly just knew the myth of them without having read 
anything more contemporary. Um, we we just watched Splash again, the film, the Tom Hanks film. Um, it was bad and it's quite bad, but I watched it and I was like, I, I hadn't seen it since I was a kid, but I was like, oh, I saw half of the beats of the first half of the story from Splash. Like it is exactly <laughs> this book, except, you know, a little different. <laughs> so I'm leading up to it. All right, we have a lot of great questions um, about sort of like what it's like to write comics. Um, Ember would like to know, could you speak to the differences between writing for comics and writing for TV? TV execs versus book publishers is also mm -hmm. part of this question. Yeah, um, TV execs, it's, I think um, it's bigger writing for any, anything that is like TV or movies. There's a huge amount, it's a huge production. There's a huge amount of money that goes into it and they're going to be very specific about what they want, which is not to say that you can't like make amazing, amazing work, um, but it is, you just have to like kind of find out how to speak, the, like talk the talk a little bit more um, and fit the stories that you want into the format that is like considered right. Also TV is like writing a 22 minute episode. It's just like a very specific kind of story. Um, comics I find to be a lot looser and a lot freer. And um, I think that's why I probably will always make comics is because I can just tell these things that are very personal. And I, I also don't, when I'm working, when I've written scripts for animation, I'm aware that I am just one part of it and it's going to go on to other writers to get have jokes put in, it's going to get boarded, it's going to get designed, it's going to get animated, there's going to be so many hands on it um, that I'm really trying to make a structure for people to like do their best work on. Um, when I'm writing a book for myself to draw, it's like this really pleasant kind of like, like I'm writing it and I know that I can draw it and I'm not going to bother anyone else with it, <laughs> we're just, we're, it's just going to be like something between me, myself and I and that's kind of, that can be really fun. Yeah, I also think it's worth pointing out that as a working writer, it's very hard to just do your own work. And a lot yeah. of being a working writer is like working with other people on television shows or on whatever form of copy that is like the sort of more commercial side of it. And I think that it's, I, even if it's not your voice and all your ideas, it's such, an, a, it's such an important part of like all the muscles you need as a writer to be able to walk into a room and solve a problem. It's not your problem. That's like someone else saying, we have to get this person to a birthday party in five yeah. minutes, but we have something funny to happen and to be able to come up with a solution is always gonna and to, and to be back like, to your own work. What's the logic of the world that you've made and how can I sort of like almost translate my stories into the language that you're speaking? Um, and it's a really fun challenge in its own way. And I think that the collaboration is so cool and it's, it's yeah. I, I, I wouldn't like pick one or the other. <laughs> um, they're, both, they're both really cool. Yeah, it's super fun. Writer, yeah. TV writer rooms are so fun. They're like the silliest places, honestly. I know, you're just like, let's talk about our childhood traumas for four hours and then turn it into a cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had um, a question from Alicia who just wanted to know, what is the name of that 80s lesbian fantasy series that you mentioned, Molly? I can't remember. Oh no. Uh -oh. Do you remember who wrote it? <laughs> I would have said, no, I would have no. said name. Put yes. in your Instagram later. Yeah, I'll like tweet about it or something. It's like I know that I I know that it was fairly popular. Um, it's like lesbian warriors. It's like a classic high fantasy. Um, <laughs> that's all I got. <laughs> as I said, as I said, I blanked out during it. <laughs> um, well, we will look forward to that, and then we will all go and read it. I'll try to find it and tweet about it. I promise. Uh, Megan says, Mariko, you mentioned that you were tired of certain queer stories. What stories would you and Molly most like to see? Um, I mean, I think uh, like one thing that I've been really interested in is like, uh, like stories about other generations and stories about older queers is mm -hmm. something that's been really interesting to me. One of my favorite documentaries is this Canadian documentary that came out ages ago by this woman named Lynn Fernie called uh, Forbidden Love. Um, and I can't, there's like a, if you Amazon it, there's like, it's like forbidden love dot dot something else. And it's a lot of interviews with uh, queer people, specifically lesbians uh, or sort of queer women um, and talking about what it was like to be queer in like the, the 50s, like 40s, 50s. And that story to me is really fascinating. Like, you know, it's like, a, I was watching the Hulu Pride series. And one of the things that one of the interviewees said was, there's kind of this notion that being queer back, you know, back in the 50s or whatever it was, a certain way. 
that's not really based on the actual experiences of the people who were living it, like that it had its own complexities. And so I think there's a lot of, because queer coming out stories are often sort of younger stories, especially today. Like I, I'm really interested in like the sort of, like, you know, what's it like to be queer in 80? Yeah. Yeah. I also, I also want to see, yeah, stories that span life more and just messy things. I think um, something I really loved recently was uh, Work of Progress. Did you see that show, Marika? Yes. Um, yeah. It's like, like uh, um, one of the, oh my God, I'm blanking on her name, um, but it's, okay. It's, it's a really good show and it is about like a bush lesbian who like considers herself a lesbian and then she like like starts dating a person who identifies as a trans man and kind of it's like about like her exploring her identity and him ex like he's actually really secure in his identity um but she's so messy she's this like older bush lesbian she is so like not on top of anything like her life is in shambles and she's horrible to everyone in her life in different ways and it's it's it i just hadn't really ever seen anything like that before but, yeah so it's she's not a villain but she is not a perfect person and it's not it's not concerned about representation re representing itself to straight people at all like it's it's fully just trying to tell a story of this complicated anti-hero basically um and and yeah i just i just want to see more things like that i think that like there definitely is a wave of stuff that is like younger and is like can be like very very sweet um and I, I sort of count this book among it honestly um and i think that that is really necessary and lovely but then also i just want to see the messy stuff too because <laughs> yeah. like, kind of like ugly like crazy stuff um, yes sometimes it's super weird <laughs> being just a person in general yeah like i think that it's it's you know like the sort of intersection of like you know queerness and mental health or like you know queerness in class and like things that are Kind of as opposed to this sort of platform of like we will put everybody in the same place and then and they're all queer which is great but i also think that there's there's so many more factors at play like you know yeah. to like that experience for sure like you yeah. know queer and in wisconsin or something like that like i just <laughs> think that there there's like more more space for more stories in other cultures and like i think it yeah it's sometimes sometimes queer stories are very much like it's almost like we're like brainstorming for our perfect world. And that's not a bad thing either. That's a very important like thing to do. And that's a very important part of activism and social justice. But yeah, to also love ourselves at the sort of complicated, messy, imperfect place that we are now is also really um, uh, interesting to me. Yeah. Um, so this isn't the question, but a couple of things that you've said um, since starting the Q&A reminded me of a thought that I had earlier, which is that you specifically brought up um, um, what's her name? The Little Mermaid. And I thought that was really interesting because you were talking about um, queering stories and also like what characters are allowed to be. And Hans Christian Andersen, as far as anyone can tell, was queer. Mm -hmm. So like the outcome of that character is actually even more resonant than you might otherwise think. Yeah. Um, because that was the outcome that he may have seen without projecting on him too much. Um, like what he was allowed to see himself turning into and what yeah like our generations are allowed to tell story stories and about and how they're allowed to end are just so different um so I actually love that you brought him up um because it's it's like really it was very clear cut and resonant um uh, and I kind of I sort of I knew that about him but I kind of forgot it like as we were discussing that story and yeah, yeah I, just, I forgot that yeah yeah it's very sad it's very sad and very like interesting to look at the myths that we've written for ourselves from the past and what the lessons and what the sort of emotions are in there. Yeah, well, it's just like the, the complicated history of queer anguish, anguish, right? Like the complicated mm -hmm. history of the sort of obliteration of self because of being this thing that's an impossible thing to be, right? As opposed yeah. to, you know, the sort of new mundaneness. Like I just watched Mayor of Easttown and there's like this lesbian character who's just like the most normal part of the story. She's just like, hey, gay I'm dating this person and uh my mom is super messed up I'm pretty cool though <laughs> it's like I love that the lesbian is just like coasting through the middle of the story and everybody else losing their shit <laughs> yeah 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 and it is I think there's like still thinking about stories I want to see told there's so many stories about us that have been told by straight and cis people and we therefore are like, we can't tell these stories anymore. Stories of, especially of queer anguish, of queer death, 
coming out stories, we have all these ideas of like these, there is like tropes around these that have been completely constructed by straight people. And yeah. I feel like we are not allowed to have access to those stories. And I want to read those stories written by queer people. Yeah. Um, really bad. <laughs> I need to, in fact. Um, we have so many great questions and I'd love to ask a couple of more um, if that's okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> excellent. So we have one from Chai. By the way, I'm sorry if I mispronounce anyone's name, um, which I think is really meaty and great. In a lot of scenes from your book, Kelsey speaks more formally than Morgan. Was any of her speech pattern influenced by your Sam Frodo, com sorry, yeah. Sam Frodo comics or a Tolkien reference in general? I noticed there were a few language patterns that cropped up in the best way possible. I absolutely love how both Kelty and Morgan have specific and unique ways of talking. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I wrote it a little bit before I, I started doing this like really big deep dive into that um, fandom, <laughs> but I think it, it was definitely uh, in my mind. So there's actually, I think I'm allowed to say this, there's an audio book coming out um, and we got a like Scottish actress to do Kelty's voice because in my mind she sort of has a little bit of a lilt and so I really just like the idea of her being a little bit old-fashioned and kind of just she's I don't know she's just a magical creature um yeah and I, I love her just having that little bit of like kind of old world fantasy um I guess it is probably it's probably slightly Tolkien inspired um as are many things that mm -hmm. I do well and also if you think about it the way that Morgan is speaking is an affectation yeah. based on her social group, right? Like, yeah. it's like, who has the affectation? Is it Kelty or is it Morgan? Yeah. Yeah, I think there was, um, <laughs> there was a, a rejected idea. This was rejected very early, but I was doing a lot of research about Selkies and trying to just find all the variations of that story. And there's one version where Selkies are the souls of drowned people. And so I was like, maybe Kelty is like, oh, God, <laughs> it's gonna be like a murder mystery or something. Um, and I obviously didn't do that, but that would have been really cool. But I did, I kind of like the idea it was just an idea. I think it, the idea of her being a little bit old fashioned kind of stuck, stuck around in my head. <laughs> That's really great. I can just imagine where you're like, what if she's like the soul of someone who drowned and everyone in the room is like, whoa. I know, that's it. <laughs> I sort of, I, I was like talking with my editor about it and she was like, that could be a bit much. I was like, you know, I guess it is a children's book, <laughs> but it, it's so cool. Um, but no, I really, I really like, I like what we, and I think I decided to not do that also because I wanted her to be like very alive and vibrant and not sort of be a ghost character in any way. Um, but yeah. I, it, the idea of her being old fashioned stuck around. Well, CJ would actually like to know how you discovered selfies and <clears throat> why you decided to write a story about one to begin with. Yeah, um, I don't know where I learned about them at first. Um, I was a, one of those, you know, I was like a Harry Potter kid. So I was really into different kinds of mythology. Um, so I think I just learned about it there. And I was always really intrigued with like people turning into animals and animals who turn into people. Um, and that's definitely a theme in like all of my work um, in different ways because I just find it really interesting um so yeah yeah that's 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 kind of it and I, I I made a comic about selkies when I was 19 and so going back to that idea of like the stories that we have really early that we just have to tell like that was kind of one of those and then it was a really short comic and so when I was kind of trying to figure out what I wanted to make my next book about I went back to that and was like I think there's actually a lot more here that I can expand on um, and also seals are, they're so cute. <laughs> they're so smart. So I know. It's they're so smart eyes. And, like, friendly and I, yeah, I just love them. So it was, yeah, it makes sense. They are perfect. And if anyone has not seen Secret of Roninish in particular, it's just uh -huh. like this insanely perfect movie about like, this kid who like disappears from his fishing village and these kids later on are like trying to find him again. There's lots of like fixing an old house by whitewashing it with giant yes. brushes. It's just like a, something about it is just like insanely <laughs> satisfying from beginning to end. There's a, some great seal actors. Like there are seals. Great seals <laughs> doing great work. <laughs> it's really impressive. Yeah. Um, um, Emmy has a question that I think is really interesting, um, which is when editors edit your writing, do they also edit your images? Oh, um, no, you know, I, I have a pretty specific experience because I've really just worked with one editor, Amanda Maciel, who's amazing at Scholastic. Um, and she's been really open. I think I'm her first graphic novelist that she was working with as an editor. So she really let me like take the reins in that in that area um but yeah she she mostly sort of reads it for for readability and legibility and making sure it all flows which is so so helpful um 
And then, yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, I, I haven't had, I, I've mostly just gotten to draw exactly what I want. So I'm very lucky, honestly. <laughs> I think most comics editing is like that though. I think it's uh, like, I think like it depends on what publisher, like where your publisher sort of started out, like, you know, working with them and like for a second where they are sort of more sort of comics from the get go versus like, you know, book publishers who are sort of moving into comics. Like I think really the most comic editing in terms of image editing that happens is in like, like trade comics like Marvel and DC. Yeah. That's actually where you get much more of a sort of like fine tuning of like mm -hmm. images um, as opposed to graphic novels. Yeah. Well, and that's interesting too, because in, in like DC and Marvel, you're more likely to be talking about a comic that's being created by like a larger creative team where like every single image is touched by, you know, one, two, three, four, five yeah. people as yeah. opposed to something with, with one creator. Yeah. Like even like the placement of word balloons, which goes through all yeah. of the shifting around and like, you know, like you're always, like I'm always kind of fascinated by like all the sort of tweaking that happens and it's like and it's all happening in a week so it's just like a blur to me where you're like what happened to that thing well, it's gone all right cool <laughs> <laughs> um well we have gone a little past eight so i wanted to close out with theo's question what other queer graphic novels and comics are coming out right now that inspire you oh man gosh oh right now <laughs> <laughs> like right now <laughs> I think it could be be recent or in a little while as well Dean Laura Dean is by some I forget <laughs> <laughs> uh Pashmina just uh not Pashmina um what's Jukebox. the Nitty book Jukebox. Jukebox Jukebox just came out by uh uh Nitty and that is she's a queer graphic novelist that just came out mm -hmm. um Julia takes a breath uh, by Gabby Rivera and um, I can't remember the illustrator's name, but it's sitting right there on my table. It's really cool. It's based on uh, Gabby's book, which is really great. That just came out. Um, what else? Oh, I mean, all the DC Pride stuff just came out. So that's yeah. DC Pride and Marvel, all those stuff just came out. Um, so that's really great. Right. Both of them put out like these anthologies of like queer stuff. I love that. Yeah, I'm panicking a little bit because I haven't stepped out of my house and gone to a bookstop store, which is where I usually go to get stuff um, and like find find new things. Um, but there has been like, gosh, I mean, I just feel like for a second is putting out so many lovely books, especially um, that are just like, I, it's it's cool. I think that Scholastic um, is trying to fit a little bit harder into like the categories of like middle grade young YA. And I feel like for a second is really um, putting out a lot of stuff that's like exploring the like, older YA area, mm -hmm. which is really exciting to me. Yeah. Oh, like Tilly, Wal Tilly Walden, especially, is a good example of that. Tilly Walden is doing mm -hmm. so much lovely work. Thank yeah. you. I just, like, there's, I'm literally, like, I know all of that. My mind <laughs> like, Eureka's got something. See, my Birkenstocks. <laughs> <laughs> this is yeah. Jukebox, Nine Nitty Chinani. That just came out. Um, super cool book about time traveling uh, with a jukebox. And this is uh, Celia Muscote and Muscote and Gabby Rivera. Julia takes a breath. Um, so you know what was so good? Um, Snapdragon. Did you read that? Like, yes. Lee, that was so good. I cannot so good. Talk about Kylie enough. Yes. I mean, really, there's so many. Uh, and uh, my imprint is putting out the first book that we have coming out uh, from Shirley Books is. Lifetime Passes by Terry Blass and Claudia Aguirre, uh, which is a book that's based on this very Heather's Eve premise of uh, these kids who find out that this, that this theme park that they all go to has this kind of unspoken clause, which is that if someone in your party dies in the park, you get lifetime passes. So one of the people uh, works in an old person's, in a senior's home. Oh my God. Uh, so she starts, they start bringing <laughs> seniors groups to the park, um, which is a very intense, dark premise but because it's Terry and Claudia it's a really sweet story that's actually oh my about, gosh. like what it means to sort of fit into a place and to have like the one place in the world that feels safe to you and it's about yeah. family and um it's such a it's such a beautiful book with like the most wicked premise <laughs> like you're like here's the premise okay but it's a really heartwarming book but it is it's really beautiful uh so I have that's coming out um with Shirley Books Oh, and I just saw someone say Cosmo Nights by Hannah Templar in the chat, which is so incredible. I haven't read the second one yet, but I'm yes. really pumped about it. And that book is just like, that book is just like checks 
I don't know. I'm like, here's all the things I want from queer media. And then Hannah Templar is like, here, I did them. <laughs> yes. Like, you. You're only one person. I need you to like multiply by 20 and just like make me everything. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's really just so many, um, so many amazing, I mean, I got to work with uh, Yoshi Yoshitani and uh, on a book for DC Comics, uh, which has been so much fun. And you know, she's such an incredible artist too. Like there's so many incredible LGBTQIA artists who are making so many amazing things right now. It's kind of stunning. Yeah. Yeah, it's really exciting. It just feels very wide and it feels like we're all gonna get to make the stuff that we wanna make. Yeah. And I think the too, author, it's like the name of the author. It's Mercedes Lackey. I just want to say, oh, Mercedes, of course Lackey. It's Mercedes Lackey. <laughs> <laughs> there it we is go. funny though, because I do feel like you know, at the end of every like when you do an interview and someone's like, "Can you recommend some queer authors?" and I feel like I'm like, "Okay," and then I go to all my bookshelf and I like take out all these books and I'm like, "Okay, let's make sure we make like." So you're like, "How much space do you have?" And it's just like this <laughs> list of like, "Yeah, you, <laughs> you have to read all these people." Um, and I think this might have been undersold in that really excellent thorough answer. Um, but Mariko does have an imprint and is focusing on <clears throat> comics about um, and by queer people of color. So there are going to be some incredible books coming out very soon and you just have to keep your eye on Shirley Press. Yeah, Grace, Grace Ellis and Hannah Templer are doing a book about Patricia Highsmith that is like, mm -hmm so epically amazing so interesting and it is a really just like in terms of like really looking at the complex figures of queer history like for all the things that they were you know I think it's just really it's been such a it's a, such a rewarding thing to like work with queer creators and just see like I think the goal with the imprint was to really open it up to the creators as opposed to the kinds of stories like as opposed to say like let's let's you know let's look for this kind of book it's like whatever you want to do let's like support you in whatever you want to do and the mix of books that that has resulted in has been so cool god i am so excited i think i've heard a little bit but i haven't like heard you talk about your imprint and i and like the specific mission of it and that is just so incredible like that's so, it's so needed and it's so you were like the perfect person to be heading that up and well, I, thank you yeah, thank you what you do yeah it's a it's a it's, it's stressful but i really love it i believe you it's called shirley books like Shirley, you jest, cool. literally like that. <laughs> it's like the silliest <laughs> name for like a queer imprint. Are you Shirley. partnered with a um, with like a, a larger publisher? It's Abrams. It's with okay, Abrams. Cool. Yeah. Oh, gosh, and I just oh my gosh, I love it. Wonderful. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I did all the Lumberjanes books with them. Yeah. Uh, and I just uh, had such an incredible experience, and yeah, I felt like I was like it was actually my girlfriend's idea, my partner's idea. She oh. was like, "Why don't you just do an imprint?" And I was like. Uh -huh. <laughs> like that's a really good idea. Yeah. Oh yes. Well, I appreciate both of you so 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 much um, for joining us tonight and for this great conversation um, because I think it dug into a lot of the things that the people in this room care a lot about. Um, and I am so excited to read your most recent books and also to see everything that both of you and all of your authors and friends and compatriots mm -hmm. in writing um, have coming out. So thank yes. you again. Yes, thank you for okay. writing and making an amazing book, Molly. I'm very oh. like, thank you for making me cry. Thank you for that. I'm just like, like I, I'm, I'm so, I just love, I love your work so much. And I love you <laughs> so much. You. And I'm like, thank you so deeply for it. Like those really, really thorough yeah. questions. Like I could talk to you for probably 24 hours at a time. Like, yeah, well, <laughs> hopefully in person soon. Hopefully in person soon. I would love to. Let's yeah, see. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, right. thank, thank you everybody you. for coming. Thank you. And don't forget, if you don't have a signed book yet, you can go back and buy one still. Thank you all for being here tonight and have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your weekend. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.